You're listening to the Bulldog Insider Podcast, brought to you by Essentia Health. It only takes one step, twist, or crunch to know something doesn't feel right. Essentia Health's orthopedic and sports medicine team gets you back to doing what you love with commitment, resilience, intention. We're here to keep you moving forward. Visit EssentiaHealth.org to learn more about orthopedics and sports medicine like nowhere else. Hello and welcome to the Bulldog Insider Podcast, brought to you by Essentia Health. I'm Matt Wellens, the Bulldogs hockey beat writer at the Duluth News Tribune in the Rink Live. And I'm Zach Schneider, the television voice of UMD Hockey on My Nine Sports. We're sad to report that the Bulldogs hockey season is over. The women were ousted in the NCAA Regional Final in Minneapolis on Saturday. Uh, the men's season ended with a loss at St. Cloud State in Game 3 of an NCHC quarterfinal series on Sunday. But we're not done yet. There's still college hockey happening at Amsoil Arena this weekend. Duluth is hosting the 2023 NCAA Women's Frozen Four. Teams will start arriving on Wednesday, uh, right before another winter storm hits us. Who knows what the severity of that's going to be. Practice and media day is on Thursday. Then on Friday, we're going to have Ohio State taking on Northeastern at 2.30 p.m., followed by Minnesota and Wisconsin at 6 p.m. Uh, this week on the podcast, we want to take you behind the scenes of a Frozen Four. So we enlisted the help of a, a good friend of ours. I hope he considers us a, a good friend. He's uh, had to deal with us a lot the last, man, six, seven years now. He's a good friend of ours at the NCAA. He helped Zach and I out as a media coordinator during UMD's run of uh, four straight men's Frozen Fours. He never threw the News Tribune crew out of the building or started revoking our credentials when we were issuing illegal newspapers on the ice after games after bulldog national championships um he's now helping oversee he's helped oversee the last two women's frozen fours now at penn state and then here at amsoil arena welcome to the podcast mark bedix hi mark hello matt zach thank you guys so much for having me on i appreciate it a great deal it's not like a sore spot at the ncaa us slipping those papers on the ice a couple times now is it <laughs> never i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> there we go so mark Give us your official title with the NCAA these days, and, and what does that all in, entail? You don't just to just you don't get to just have fun hanging out at Frozen Fours with us. Yeah, so my title is Associate Director of Championships and Alliances. So I'm officially in operations role. Previously, I was in the media coordination department. So in the past, literally for 20 years, from starting in 2002 up until 21, I was the media coordinator for the men's frozen four. So that included everything from running the press conferences to um, being in charge of the stack crew, anything to do with um, media operations at the frozen four and for the tournament as a whole, any kind of press releases, anything to help publicize the event. And I, during that time, I'd kind of, part-time done some operations and ran some championships, ran the skiing championship for a long time, the rowing championship for a long time, wrestling championship. So two years ago, I moved permanently over to operations and now just fully do operations. And I work with division one women's soccer, division one women's golf and division one women's ice hockey. So from that standpoint, from an operations role, I'm in charge of basically soup to nuts from the whole thing with regards to selecting the sites that host the championship to selecting the teams that go in the championship and then working, like in this case, with Duluth on four-line daily basis to make every, sure everything's covered for the championship so the fans and the student-athletes, coaches, everybody has a great time. You left out your media coordination role dealing with needy reporters like my, myself who are trying to get hotels. And Mark really did do, do it all for, for a lot of us. Mark, so how long have you been with the NCAA now? Yeah, actually, the 18th will be twenty my 25th anniversary. How'd you get involved with the organization? So I graduated from Purdue University in 1992 and uh, worked, worked as a student in the sports information office and then did an internship at the University of Florida and then worked at the University of Cincinnati and then at Marquette University. And I was at, when I was at Marquette. I was heavily involved actually in soccer and um, the NCAA started to do statistics for soccer. So they wanted to hire somebody who can actually start the NCAA on the path of doing national soccer statistics. So I got that job and literally 
started doing soccer statistics along with a couple others, records, books, that type of thing. And then I moved from there to doing some media coordination with championships, started out with division one men's soccer. And then literally 2000, Two, or actually 2001, John Painter, who did it for a long time, left the association. And they asked if I wanted to do it, so I was all over it. So I literally started working with men's ice hockey in 2002, and like I said, had been doing that ever since. Whenever somebody's at a job this long, Mark, or with an organization this long, I know probably the titles have, have changed a lot uh, over your time with the NCAA. But we asked this question, I think, to Bob Nygaard, too, when he was on the podcast earlier this year. What are what stands out to you as far as what's changed from the 1980s when you started to to now? I mean, obviously the the advent of social media, the news cycle has changed. But what's been different as you prepare for a uh, Frozen Four now in 2023 versus uh, maybe you know 10, 15, 20 years ago? Yeah. So my first one I ever did was 2002 when we were at the Excel Energy Center when um, Minnesota beat Maine in that infamous game. And I would say the biggest thing is just the way news, like it's now, it's like obviously newspapers almost don't exist in the standpoint of the physical newspaper. Now it's more about right now, like people are screening Twitter, they're on websites. So the articles are still getting published. It's not in a physical paper. So the deadline obviously has changed. So our ability to provide the service to the media has changed to trying to accomplish and help with that role. So that's definitely one of the biggest things. I also, it's funny because when I first started literally like March of 98, there was the thought of alcohol ever being sold at an NCAA event was like foreign. Like that would never happen in a million years. And now we obviously do. And so I think some of those things trying to be a more forward thinking organization definitely is at the forefront. How can we help student out the experience, different things like that. So Yeah. Alcohol at an NCAA event. That was sacrilegious. And you'd always have every year I'd have fans come up to me and they just forgot every year that all of a sudden they got to the NCAA tournament and and you couldn't get a beer. Not the case now. So Mark, how many different uh, championship events uh, have you worked for? You kind of summed it up. How many different championships over the years have you gotten to be involved with 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 the NCAA? I'd say definitely over 100. Yeah, actually, it's funny because I actually at one point in time didn't keep track of it, but now I don't. I'm definitely over 100, though, so I don't like I said, but currently I work with um, Division One women's soccer in the fall, Division One women's ice hockey, and then Division One golf in the spring. But like through the years, I literally worked with Division Two wrestling, Division One wrestling, tennis, swimming. So yeah, pretty much everything at some point in time. Are there major differences between the sports or or I'm guessing some events are are a little more championship events are a little more relaxed and some are a little more uh, high stress. Oh yeah. But and a lot, some of that comes from the coaching and obviously some coaching bodies are more like, it's funny. The one I always get about skiing, right? So they're just so used because of it's so weather dependent. Like if they need to be able to adjust the schedule, like in a moment's notice. So you would tell us a skiing coach, Hey, you know, we, we were going to start the giant solemn at, you know, 10 o'clock, but actually the storm's coming through. So we're actually going to move it to 11. And you were telling them that at, you know, nine 45 and like, okay, no problem. Whereas if you ever told the hockey coach that you're going to change the game time 15 minutes before they blow a gasket. So there's definitely something from a, a sports standpoint that they're just, you know, kind of is what it is. And that's the culture of the sport. So you said that first frozen four uh, for you was uh, 2002 XL when Minnesota beat Maine. What still stands out to you about that first frozen four? I mean, it's it's definitely one of the, if not the, but probably probably the second most memorable championship I've ever run. And I, the crowd, the atmosphere was like crazy. I can't imagine an atmosphere at a championship being any more crazy than it was that day. The place was going absolute bonkers. And the, the way the game unfolded, obviously, that Minnesota scoring the last minute of the game to tie it up and then scoring in overtime to win it, obviously, basically on home ice, it was just crazy. So yeah, I, the fans by far is in the atmosphere just in general was crazy. What's the other one? You said it might be number two. What would be number one if it's that one? So I would say it's totally for a different reason. But so coming out of COVID, I was working with the skiing championship and the skiing championship was the first championship that we held after COVID and just the look and sense of appreciation that the student athletes had to be able to compete for national championship. And it was like, they, it was just a sense of normalcy came back. It was just like, and the appreciation was just kind of undescribable because it we'd gone so long without really being able to compete for national championship. So just that one will always stick out. And obviously well, the COVID testing that it was, you know, 
remember memorable for reasons otherwise but like i said just the look on the student athletes and the coaches and the amount of thank yous and everything from that whole standpoint just because it was so like such a long time coming and everybody like said they finally felt like they were back to normal being able to compete without masks on that type of thing so yeah that was definitely number one what are your top three uh frozen fours i guess you gave us the number one already what other frozen fours are, are up there for you among all the ones you've done you know what I got to throw in a bulldog title, don't I? <laughs> hey, that's that's entirely up to you if you want to pander to the to the UMD uh, fan base or or not. XL Energy Center has kind of been fortunate, right? It's getting yes. between the Gophers and the Bulldogs. I feel like uh, that's that's helped uh, you know make that place a, a pretty rocking rocking building. And and two overtime Frozen Four is actually there involving UMD and the Gophers now. Yeah, so I. 2016 in Tampa with North Dakota Wing it actually was really a great event there. Again, place was rocking. It's when the one thing I'll say about the Bulldogs, and you guys know because you get to deal with Scott on a daily basis, Scott Sandlin's like about the most professional, best person you can possibly deal with. He's just was never had any issues. Whatever you needed Scott to do, he was amazing. So I... I'm not sure I specifically wanted to come out, but the other one that I can think of, and it wasn't, it was more of the whole Frozen Four was in, when we were in Philadelphia and we had the um, Gophers right scoring with less than a second to win it. And then in the championship game, Shane Gossespierre going plus seven and then winning seven to four. That was probably two best players, I guess, displays. I'll say Shane was that year. And then Johnny Gaudreau was just amazing during his whole era playing the frozen force for Boston college. No one from the NCAA Mark would ever, would ever say that they were rooting for, for one team or another to be in a championship and as they shouldn't, right. I mean, you guys are there to provide a good event, no matter which teams make it, but how much different is it when you're dealing with an O2 when a Minnesota is at the X or, you know, an 11 or an 18 when UMD is at the X, when, when the home team, so to speak, makes it to an event like that, how much difference have you noticed over the years in terms of the atmosphere or, or is there any, is there still just excitement about the sport? Uh, and the championship in general there's definitely an excitement just I mean, anytime you're obviously competing for a national championship right that's what the goal is for any student athlete you want to try to win the national title so there's definitely that that being said like from a media standpoint right when if it's a local crowd the amount of attention just you know is tenfold so that's definitely brings a huge aspect of it. and then the more media you have there from a student athlete standpoint when they're at a press conference and there's you know 200 300 people as opposed to 50 it makes a huge impact and they kind of definitely has a different feel and then from an attendance standpoint especially like even men's frozen four there's a difference between tickets being sold and ticket people be butts being in the seat so when you get the situations where it's literally like i said that day in 2002 and it's happened some other times where you're like basically turning people away i mean the atmosphere you just can't be beaten that couldn't even imagine a million years what it'd be like playing on that situation. So, Mark, when, when the NCAA is accepting bids and considering sites for, for national championships for an event like a men's or women's Frozen Four, what is the NCAA looking for? What's important for, for these host sites? Obviously, weather's not in it because... <laughs> <laughs> you know, you look at the spectrums, Duluth and Tampa this year for the, the men's and women's uh, complete opposite climates. But but uh, what's the NCAA looking for? I think biggest piece is somebody who really wants to do it. So that's by far the number one, the amount of time, effort. And I'll use this to shout out to Abby Strong, like her and at the University of Minnesota Duluth and the rest of her staff and Forrest Carr is obviously AD and he's given direction to those guys. But the amount of time, effort is just so much and obviously they got their normal day jobs right they got to worry about the university's teams and the fact that they're doing all this above and beyond so the fact that there's buy-in by the host is a huge piece of this puzzle so a you have to have a venue that's willing to do it somewhere that they're going to put in you know the time and effort and jeff stark and his crew down at the deck have been amazing to work with they had the ice already in on saturday night with the four logos even though the games were on saturday literally i got a picture you know saturday night and the logos are already down on the ice so, i mean just again the level of commitment and that's what makes a difference when the student athletes come in they're like man this is amazing and you know they don't skip they don't miss a beat so it's the whole Aves first facility along with the commitment of the institution to do it and then you know it's a little bit the men definitely try to do a little bit of a a tourist destination every once in a while obviously it'll be in vegas in a couple of years so it's one of those things where they have a fan base that can kind of travel whereas from women's standpoint we're trying to build that up 
So we want to make sure we're going to places where they're going to have a great experience. So this week, hopefully, when we only get, you know, one inch of snow and the roads are awesome and everybody comes and we're supposed to have a really, really good crowd on Friday and Sunday. So, you know, you go to the game, you have this great experience because there's a ton of people there. Then you're like, hey, mom, hey, dad, I want to go next year. You know, I know it's in New Hampshire, but can we make that our spring break? Can we make that our vacation? That's the type of thing ultimately we need to try to um, develop and cultivate. How long from start to finish are you working on an event like this, Mark, uh, from the from the bid process, which happens a couple of years out to actually putting the, you know, the X's and O's together, putting all the logistical planning. One of the things I, I got asked when I when I joined Grandma's Marathon two and a half years ago was, is that a full time year round job? And we do other things uh, throughout the year. And just like you have, you know, uh, championships in the fall and the spring to go along with the hockey in the winter. But at what point do you kind of kick it into high gear? What's the timeline uh, of prep that you need for uh, for each of these tournaments? You know what? It's kind of cyclical a little bit, but by the same token, like I was been dealing with hotels for New Hampshire literally the last couple months, I'm trying to finalize which hotels we're going to be using. So we're already starting those conversations. And then it's other piece of the puzzle is if they've done it before. So if it's brand new, the learning curve is obviously a lot more than if somebody, if you've been somewhere back to back years, that type of thing. So we're definitely, New Hampshire will have person are there likely this weekend. And so we'll kind of start those conversations. So it's basically like kind of a year out, but then like I said, we'll revisit in the summer. Then in the early fall, probably like August, September, I'll go take a site visit with my, with the chair of the committee and um, check it out on site and then go through meetings. And we usually have like one meeting a month in the fall. And then the starting like January one, we have them every other week. One of the things that you guys have to deal with that we don't necessarily is you don't know who's going to be part of your championship uh, until right before. Was it easier to do the men's Frozen Four because you had the week off in between uh, the regionals and the the Frozen Four? Or does it not really matter uh, turning around in a week uh, here now on the women's side? No, it definitely is helpful to have the week off. No question about it. Yeah. So, I mean... Again, I'll give Jeff credit to his crew. Like again, from an even from an ice standpoint, right? The men literally have that whole extra week, whereas Jeff and his crew are literally throwing it in on Saturday night, getting it ready. Because obviously, the ice is most important part of the atmosphere. So definitely, everything time helps for sure. For sure. Mark, what have been some of your your favorite locations over the years? And are there some tangibles that that you liked about those those sites, those locations, those hosts that, you know, maybe aren't on on paper when it comes time to to select, you know, sites and and bids and such for for Frozen Fours? Ooh, you got me on that one. So let me I again I'll keep jumping back. Excel Energy Center has been amazing for the men's like in part that's obviously they they again I described this before. They really really want to host They do all the little things. They're super excited. They'll do whatever it takes to get the job done. And then obviously the chance of a Minnesota, North Dakota team making the Frozen Four when it's there is really high. So in the buildings, obviously newer. So it's just that's a great facility. Whereas Boston, similar, but the TD Garden's a lot older. So it has some definitely challenges, we use those terms. But again, from that standpoint, like hockey, Steve Metcalf, they do an amazing job hosting there. So it's similar in terms of, again, the chance of one of the hockey schools, even ECEC, somebody local distance where, you know, they're going to get a huge fan base is definitely, yeah, right there. All right. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll have more with Mark Bedix. You're listening to the Bulldog Insider Podcast brought to you by Essentia Health. Greetings from Northlandia, a place to bring your curiosity because here you will find curiosities. Whether it's a look inside the Northern Rail Train Car Inn or an introduction to Duluth's musical roboticist Robot Rickshaw, we celebrate the region's distinctive people, places, and history. Each week, I'm joined by my fellow reporters who share the unique and fascinating stories that they discover while exploring the Northland. You can find new episodes of the Northlandia podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Join us along this journey and discover the extraordinary stories that you just might miss if you're not in the right place at the right time, ready to step off the beaten path with no rush to return here in Northlandia. Hi, I'm Maria Lockwood, a reporter with the Superior Telegram. Explore Superior and Douglas County history with me on Archive Dive, a monthly podcast available at superiortelegram.com or wherever you listen to podcasts.
Welcome back to the Bulldog Insider Podcast, brought to you by Essentia Health Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. They're proud to be the team physicians for the UMD Bulldogs and provide sports medicine care to more than 25,000 student athletes in the community to ensure they can compete at the highest level while protecting their long-term health and athletic futures. Thanks to Essentia Health for their support of the Bulldog Insider Podcast. I'm Matt Wellens, along with my co-host, Zach Schneider, and our guest, Mark Bedix from the, the NCAA. Mark, just to kind of close things out here, you know, you and I had talked, uh, your last men's Frozen Four was Pittsburgh, uh, where UMass uh, got its revenge on UMD en route to winning an NCAA title. And then your first women's Frozen Four was a year ago at Penn State, where um, UMD lost to Ohio State in the, the national championship there. Between the two Frozen Fours, I, I feel like we saw a shift in college athletics, you know, following the NCAA's gender equity review. There was a lot of attention focused on college basketball, but the report also talked a lot about the, the men's and women's frozen fours. And we had kind of talked a little bit about it. I didn't know exactly at the time that you were moving from the men's frozen four to the women's frozen four when you were picking my brain about uh, what was going, what how the eerie frozen four was that year. Very uh, clever prep you were doing at that time. I know things don't just happen overnight and such, but how have you kind of seen the, that gap between the men's and frozen women's frozen fours and, and how have you seen in this short time the women's frozen four kind of grow and i always put an asterisk on the eye that eerie frozen four that was during the pandemic that's probably not a good comparison for my sake but i feel like from going from eerie to penn state there have been some big jumps and in, in just how the event was was run and conducted it, it seemed bigger at penn state last year yeah I, that's a great point so the amount of time effort that we put in to basically make sure we do the best we can have the best experience for both student athletes, the men's and the women's, and I use this term all the time, is the whole, it's, we, we want the experiences to be equitable, not equal. So we want to make sure whatever is best for the women, the women get, whatever is best for the men, the men get. So we won't try to necessarily deprive men of something because of the women and vice versa. So it has literally been, it's basically a daily conversation. We have somebody in our office who's in charge of the gender equity report, basically making sure that things get done, they're supposed to get done. So we have like this literally 70 item checklist between the men and women, make sure that what are the men doing, what are the women. And again, so I'll share this. So the one thing that's different, again, I'll use the term equitable. So the men's coaches wanted to go away from doing a reception that they used to always do. And the men's coaches didn't feel like they wanted to do that. So from a men's standpoint, they're getting rid of the reception, but the women still wanted to do that. So the women's going to have a um, reception on Thursday night at the Great Lakes Aquarium down there. It's going to be a really cool event with um, red carpet, professional photographer, 3D photo booth, that type of stuff. And um, the men are going to do lounges at the hotels. So kind of not the same, but again, equitable as opposed to equal. And then in terms of like a budget from a signage standpoint, basically everything I've asked for to get the women's frozen forward where it needs to be, I've gotten the approval. So our signage budget is literally the same, if not a couple more bucks. And um, so for everybody coming to the games this weekend, it'll be apparent. I mean, the signage is going to be amazing. The amount of money we put in is incredible. So it's really trying to make sure that the student out the impact at both the men's and women's again is equitable and everybody has a great time and realizes that they were at a frozen four which is ultimately the goal are there still areas where, where you see there there could be some some improvement i like that you brought up the the equitable thing because i got a laundry list of things i'd say just because the men do it it doesn't mean it's a good idea I, you know I what I think... jump, the other thing is like the perfect examples right regionals right it would be would women ever go to non or go to predetermined regionals right that would seem to be silly at least from my point of view right the, i mean they, i can i can i can confirm from the last two years when umd and minnesota play a regional in the state of minnesota even though the women way better attendance than when they play it in Manchester, New Hampshire. Like last weekend, uh, Saturday, there were probably three times as many people inside Little Ritter Arena as there was uh, in 2015 when I watched the Bulldogs and Gophers play a regional semi in, in Manchester, New, New Hampshire. Right. And we, we've seen the women be a little more forward thinking too. They jumped on the NPI right away. They have uh, they were the first to go to, we're going to weigh overtime wins as 65-35 instead of the more cautious 55 uh, four 45. They're a little more ag aggressive and adventurous, I think, sometimes than the men, which is probably good for this tournament because you guys are trying to grow the women's Frozen Four and turn this into a, a destination event like the men's Frozen Four has become. Yeah, absolutely. So that's we're going out for bid literally. So the bids will open up for the 27 through 30 Frozen Fours this fall. It will um, they have like six months to turn a bid 
like four or five months. So then the committees will um, make the decisions and then we'll announce them like October 1st of next year. So I think it's a situation where we got to try to figure out what's the sweet spot. And again, from a location standpoint, so A, where it's going to be schools that support women's hockey and also try to grow the sport without trying to jeopardize either one. So what are those sweet spots that are out there? So it's definitely a challenge, but one we got to take head on and try to do the best we can. Have you noticed, Mark, in your transition from working with the men's Frozen Four to the women's that, I mean, we say this a lot when we talk about this, uh, this gap maybe between the two genders or the connection between the men's and the women's game, but they are the same sport. They've got the same, a lot of the same rules. They play on the same ice sheets a lot of times, but in terms of the NCAA, they're in completely different places. Is that, is that a fair assessment of, of how you approach a men's tournament versus a women's tournament? Like the goals are the same in terms of the student athletes athlete experience and the fan experience, but you're coming at it from a a slightly different perspective. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, we have that conversation almost daily. And what, again, and that's really, really tricky because what's best for one isn't necessarily best for the other. So that's what you got to try to figure out. And so that's definitely a hard part. And again, Matt brought up like you're comparing Tampa to Duluth, right? So some of the infrastructures of the two cities are totally different, which is fine. But then, so what can, what can Duluth provide an offer that Tampa can and vice versa. So just got to figure that piece out. And that's, you know, one of the challenges definitely. Mark, do you see this event, the uh, Frozen Four, it's traditionally been held, you know, on or near, you know, the the home rink of, of the host team, on or near campus sites. Do you think this is an event that could in the future succeed, you know, at a true neutral site, maybe outside college hockey's footprint, you know, kind of like Tampa has become, you know, a, a popular spot for the men's Frozen Four? And no, I'm not just asking this because we're got another snowstorm barreling down on Duluth and it'd be great to be in, in Tampa right now. But I'm just thinking other places maybe someday. I mean, is that maybe the goal at some point that women's college hockey can start start experimenting in different locations like the men are? I at some point in time, I definitely don't want to put the cart before the horse as they, the saying goes. I we need to be making sure we're getting good crowds when we're where we're at. So I, I was just having the conversation with somebody the other day is from a sport of women's hockey, how can we grow the game just in general? The more we can do that, the better off we're going to be. So again, and I used the example before, like if we have, you know, young players who come out this weekend, tell their mom or dad, that was amazing. I want to make sure I go again next year. And then they're using their vacation to fly out to New Hampshire next year. The more and more people we can get involved with that, the better we're going to have to be. And again, we can't be doing the jump off if we did that too soon and you know we don't want a situation where we're having the frozen four you know in front of a thousand people right so we need to make sure that we're got the fan base cultivated built that we're it's going to be a successful event well we should do whatever we can to, to help you this weekend you brought it up in that first segment the the tickets sold versus butts in seats when the games are happening is a completely different metric and it is all the way around college hockey uh we talked about it from a men's and a women's perspective earlier this year on this podcast so we'll just take some time here mark to say it to our to our bulldog insider audience if you've got tickets to this year's frozen four i know everyone's bummed that that umb is not part of it but go to the game because not going to the games isn't going to help uh anything go there make it a fun experience and pick a new team to root for for a couple games Absolutely. I mean, the best part about Women's Frozen Four is you literally have Olympians that you're seeing right before your eyes playing. I mean, Northeastern Ohio State's going to be an amazing game. And then obviously you got the border battle between the Gophers Badgers on Friday night. So both are going to be amazing games. They're clearly, you know, four of the best teams, if not the four best teams. So it'll be two amazing games. And it'll be, um, you guys are obviously in Duluth used to very high level women's hockey, but for those who people aren't coming, who are coming that aren't, I mean, the level is so high. Again, a lot of these players will be playing in the next Olympics. Some of them already have played in the Olympics. So it's a great experience from that standpoint. And again, the ticket sales have been going extremely well. So the atmosphere inside the building should be incredible. Snow aside, right? But so we're super excited. Excited. Again, the games are um, 2.30 and 6 on Friday and then on uh, 3 o'clock on Sunday. So we'd love to have everybody out as, po- as much as possible. And the hey. other thing I want to quick drop oh, in there, if I could, on Saturday is the Patty Kazmaier Memorial Award. And that's going to be 
atrium of the M Soil Arena. That's from 11.30 to noon. And then afterwards, there's going to be an autograph session with Hillary Knight and AJ Maletsko and Matty Rooney, all gold medal winning Olympians from the USA Hockey. So they'll be there to sign autographs. So love to have everybody out as much as possible. Everyone's used to driving around uh, snow in, in this part of the country. Just did it this last weekend for the regionals and, and such. All right. That's all the time. Uh... We have uh, on the Bulldog Insider podcast this week. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. You can find the Bulldog Insider podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get podcasts. Subscribe and rate us. For more Bulldogs hockey coverage throughout the Frozen Four and this offseason, visit theranklive.com and DuluthNewsTribune.com. Thanks to our sponsor, Essential Health, for their support of the Bulldog Insider podcast. And thanks to all of you for listening. We will catch you next week.